When I first started the podcast eight years ago, I wanted to have my good friend Bob Gettle on the show. He was the original co-host that I imagined. When I first came up with the idea of this podcast, I was like, oh, man, me and Bob, this is going to be awesome. You know, he's super funny. He's a therapist. We're, we're really good friends. He always has interesting things to say. He's not a drug addict of any sort that's going to interfere with his ability to uh, come on the podcast. And I asked him about it and Bob was like, no, are you kidding me? That's, that's stupid. Who wants to do a podcast? No, that's not exactly what he said, but he said, no. Uh, why, why did you say no back then? Anyway, I don't know if I have anything worthwhile to say to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't have anything worthwhile to say either. <laughs> that's never stopped me from making a podcast. <laughs> You just have more scruples when it comes to that sort of thing. So Bob was like, nah, not really interested. And then I was like, oh, man, what do I do? I, I had this whole thing in my head like, well, it's got to be me and Bob. And then I, because I didn't want to do it by myself. And then I thought, well, geez, who else would do it? And I thought, well, Umberto, he's not a therapist, but he likes to talk a lot. So maybe he'd like to do it with me. And so I asked Umberto and, and he ended up being a great co-host and then Lita as well. And the rest is history. But periodically I would, you know, Bob and I would hang out the original person I had in mind for this podcast. And I'd be like, man, you should come on the podcast. And he'd be like, oh yeah, maybe. And then finally we able, we were able to lock down today. I can't believe that you're here, Bob. I'm, I'm so happy. Oh, thank you. It's so nice to be here. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk with you since you're a therapist. I often have a lot of yahoos on the podcast that know nothing about our profession. And so it's wonderful to have an actual clinician that we can we can you know talk about shop stuff because I know a lot of therapists listen to this. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University Seattle, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. Bob, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Bob Gettle. I uh, am a licensed mental health counselor here in the city of Seattle. I work in my own practice. I do a lot of um, individual counseling, of course, and then uh, in the last 10 years, and then more seriously in the last five years, I've gotten interested in marriage and couples therapy, which I never thought I would be interested in. Yeah. And when they had that at school, when Kirk and I went to graduate school together, I, I didn't get why anybody would be interested in marriage or couples therapy, but it's fascinating. Yeah. And really, really hard. Yeah. That's not why I like it, though, not because it's hard. I yeah. like it because of what it can do. Um, anyway, so I've been uh, pretty much at that for the last five years, uh, very seriously studying a thing called emotionally focused couples therapy, which is, as far as we know, the only empirically validated treatment for uh, couples, uh, which doesn't mean that there aren't other good treatments out there. They just haven't been tested uh, uh, scientifically. Anyways, um, uh, so I've been a therapist in some fashion for 25 years, and we finished graduate school together in 97, mm -hmm. so almost 20 years. Yeah. And it occurred to me, what, about a month ago that I've been friends with you for 20 years and... 21. 21 years. And I do... That's right. 21. I do not like thinking about my life in such long chunks. <laughs> it makes me feel old. Yeah. We entered graduate school at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. And we were in the same prosem class right. together, which was six students sitting around in a circle with no tables talking about our feelings for six months. And we all got to know each other pretty well. And the four of us in that class became good friends. Yeah. Uh, and Bob and I have stayed friends throughout this, this entire time. And so, yeah, glad to have you on the show, Bob. Uh, I hope it goes well for you and we can have you back sometime. Yeah. So I want to talk about some serious uh, shop stuff, some clinical stuff. There was a case summary, an ethical legal case that I read on my malpractice uh, newsletter. You know, my malpractice insurance sends out this newsletter. They essentially send out occasional cases that they have worked on. And I think they're trying to scare us away from committing ethical or legal violations so that they don't have to pay out because that is worse for them. It's better if they never have to get involved. And so, I thought I would read this case. I, I've, it's paraphrased from, from the newsletter. So here it goes. Who, who is your malpractice? Mine's HPSO. Is yours HPSO? CNA? It, it was. Um, and now it's uh, somebody called Darwin. 
Darwin. Darwin Assurance. Interesting. Company. So survival of the fittest, I, I guess. I guess. So, so again, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the counselor was working in a substance abuse program. She had master's of education degree in, a, in counseling. She had a master's of education degree in counseling. So that's always kind of interesting, just chiming in here, is that you can be a counselor or therapist with a master's in education or a doctorate in education. So that's just something to, to note. She was a licensed mental health counselor, just like you. She was certified as an addiction professional with 10 years of experience. That's a chemical, de- in Washington, it's chemical dependency professional, CDP. So in addition to being a licensed mental health counselor, she's also a CDP. She worked with dual diagnosis clients. In other words, people that have both chemical dependency issues and mental health issues. She was practicing, she was a practicing alcoholic herself in the past, but it had been sober for 12 years. It's very common for chemical defen- dependency professionals to have a history of addiction. Uh, just a you know anecdotal uh, figure, I would say 95% of CDP, if not more, have been through recovery themselves and were inspired to become a CDP because of that, right? It's often kind of weird when you find somebody who's a CDP who's not been an addict at some point in their life that kind of like what are you doing here How right you get here right which is so weird because if you're a mental health counselor right. uh, not having been hospitalized for a mental <laughs> illness is is not a, you know a require or having having had that experience is not a requirement but somehow in the cd world yeah. it, it's it's like this cultural assumption that if you haven't been through a significant addiction yourself it, it's going to be hard for you to help people right but I don't think that that has any evidence. Uh, uh, of course, having that experience helps, but but I don't think that that holds any water. No, I don't either. But culturally speaking, yeah, you would be a little shunned by the community and even by clients, if they're especially clients, maybe because they're looking at you like, so you're trying, to, you're telling me uh, how to recover, and you've never been through because recovery is a very specific re- addiction and a recovery is a very specific, difficult, nuanced process. And you kind of have to go through it or be close to someone that's going through it to know all the various things. It's sort of like getting cancer and then going through cancer treatment. You know, just reading in a book wouldn't really help you to understand like the ground level. Anyway, going on with the paraphrase of the article. The client, so we have, we have the counselor, the mental health counselor, CDP, dual diagnosis practitioner. The client was a single 40-year-old successful surgeon. He had a long history of abusing alcohol, which began in his teenage years. The client had been on a drinking binge when he texted a business partner stating that he was going to kill himself. As a result, the police were called and he was taken to an emergency department to be evaluated. He was involuntarily admitted into a behavioral health unit due to being deemed a risk to himself and others. After spending one week in the involuntary unit, the client was required to attend a therapy program and Alcohol Anonymous meetings, Alcoholic Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. That's when he entered the counselor's dual diagnosis treatment group. So is this all making sense? Yeah. All right. So the client had began attending AA meetings, which happened to be the well, same. Sorry. Let me interrupt. I think you might have said the dual diagnosis cancer treatment. Unit. Did I say that? I think you did. That's funny yeah. that that sort of got into my head. Right. No. Dual diagnosis treatment. Yeah. Why would I stick in cancer? Well, you know. See, that's why you're here, Bob. Right. If if you aren't here, I'm just guessing Berto wouldn't even be listening at this point, and that would just go <laughs> right past him. And then all the listeners would be like, did he just say dual diagnosis? I didn't know there was... Anyway, okay. So, the client also began attending AA meetings, which happened to be the same meeting that the counselor attended. So, the client oh. start started, you know, because the, the, the client had been suicidal and was it was drinking had these business or uh, these these binge drinking episodes and he's involuntarily uh you know hospitalized they say i discharge they're saying look you got to start going to a treatment program and you got to start going to aa meetings so he starts this dual diagnosis treatment uh, program and the counselor is the one that's doing that. And then he just randomly picks an AA meeting in the community and it happens to be the same meeting that the counselor goes to as a participant. After the meetings, 
the counselor and several of the meeting attendees would go to dinner, which is common for AA groups to have a social element to it because not only because they become friendly, but also because they want to encourage non-drinking social activities, which are really hard to find, right? It's hard to find a, a social activity that doesn't involve drinking. You really need to be around dedicated sober people in order to have the, those kinds of things. So it's not uncommon to do that. Eventually, this evolved into only the counselor and the client going to dinner together. Okay, so we're starting to see some interesting things here. The relationship eventually became physical. And at one point, the client told the counselor that he loved her. So it's uh, escalating. <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, here because they they kind of go into detail in the article about the details and it's not really relevant. But anyway, the physical relationship went on for several months. It should be noted that the counselor is married with two children. The client continued with his sobriety initially, but at some point during their relationship, he began drinking again. He sank into depression and without consulting his physician and despite pleas, pleas from the counselor, he stopped taking his antidepressant. Often, he would send text messages asking the counselor vague questions and statements about suicide. His drinking escalated and his depression worsened when the counselor told him she was going to spend the holidays with her husband and children instead of traveling with him. On her way out of town, she tried to call him, but he would not answer. The counselor contacted his business partner requesting that he check on the client as she was concerned that something may have happened. When the business partner arrived at the client's house, the client had shot himself and had been dead for several hours. What are your thoughts about this, Bob? Oh, gosh, what a mess. Yeah. Well, um, uh, the first question that came to mind is, um, during the length of their affair, was she still acting as his um, counselor in the program? Right. I don't think they went into that detail, but maybe they did. I, I vaguely remember them saying at some point he stopped going to the dual diagnosis treatment group, but he was in it for a while. Yeah, while they were having sex. Okay, if that makes. Uh, but that yeah. So that's a question. All right. But let's say we don't know the answer to that. All right. I think this is a mistake. Whether whether or not um, they had that kind of professional relationship as opposed to the more peer to peer relationship that you would find with somebody with AD in in AA. Um, since AA has no professionals, it's uh, self-run. In any case, I think that once you become somebody's counselor, it's a good rule of thumb to think of yourself as always their counselor. It's just safer, and there are 7 billion people on this planet. It's just easier to find somebody else. Right. Uh, and just more practical in 500 different ways. Yeah. I've had this topic in other podcasts and the things that I say are there's fucking Tinder people. So why are you having sex with your clients? And she's married. So <laughs> I guess she shouldn't even be, be doing that. But yeah, there's just so many cases where people are having sex with their clients yeah. or falling in love with their clients. And, and I just think like, yeah. like think people, yeah. how, what's, you know, do you really want to risk everything on this, on this chance that's, you know, how, let me just ask you people, therapists or not, how many people have you been attracted to that ended up having it go wonderfully the entire relationship? Okay, let's just let's tally up everybody you've ever had sex with or everyone you've ever kissed or everyone you've ever like almost kissed. We're talking, you know, tens, hundreds of people maybe, right? Yeah. How many of them when you tally them all up, especially you older people that have a longer history of dating, perhaps, how many of them ended badly just on a percentage? You know, we're, I don't know. What, what percentage would you say, Bob? Not in your life, but, you know, like anecdotally, how, what do you think other people's percentage would be? Uh, well, let's define badly. So, uh, like the person has a serious beef with you upon the ending of the relationship. I, I, I hope I don't sound too cynical. Just about all of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, that's the thing. That's sort of the reason. That's the arc of relationships is you like each other and then you hate each other at some point. Right. It's very common, right? Sure. I mean, occasionally you'll have situations where it's like, eh, you know, I didn't really feel it and you're amicable, but... Even the amicable ones, you wonder. Yeah. How amicable Secret. is this really? Right. 
Right. right. Yeah. yeah. They're secretly hating me. That's that's why they broke up with me. That's right. why I'm left here on the curb and they, they're driving away. So, right. Now, say you are attracted to your client. Mm. So, let's just match up the probability with the situation here. Now, if you if you run into someone on Tinder or at the dive bar down the street and you date him and it goes badly, usually no harm, no foul, things go badly with a client and you're going to hear from a lawyer or a ethics board or something. And, th- you know, that's that's not a good scene. And that's that's why this malpractice uh, suit is is uh, is relevant. OK. Right. So we call this dual relationship or multiple relationship and that the counselor engaged not only in a relationship with the client as client therapist, but also as co-AA member and also as a friend and also as a lover. So there are four relationships I can count that she engaged in with this same person. That's why they don't call it dual relationship anymore, at least in the family therapy world, they call it a multiple relationship because sometimes it's more than two. And so this is, this is an issue. To some extent, you can even see the, even say the dual diagnosis treatment group is a dual relationship and that she's both the chemical dependency counselor and the mental health uh, therapist, right. which is already kind of, I'm sure there's literature on that topic of yeah. like, those are different roles to mm-hmm. some extent. And, need to be considered. So we can even add a, a fifth sort of dichotomy there and say there's five roles that she's playing. And if he's court ordered, if he's been forced to go to treatment, you've just got added just one more because she's sort of like the, the mon- monitor. Like, right, yeah, right. People might be asking her, is he complying with treatment? Right. And now she has this power legally over him. Right. Yeah. And apparently she's talking with his business partner. So I don't know if she has a release of information that wasn't talked about, but, right. uh, but under the circumstances, it's okay to break confidentiality. And there's those circumstances because she suspected he might be dead and right. he was a release of information being, um, uh, specific verbal, uh, written permission to speak to somebody yeah. about, right. So if the client had signed a release saying it's okay for her to talk yeah. to this business partner, probably not, probably I'm guessing. Not. Yeah. yeah. So um, so right from the beginning, we see just red flags, right? Yeah. So let's let's start with the first why in the road. When she goes, so, so she has this new client and he comes to the group and he's fresh out of the hospital and he's suicidal and he binge drinks and he's depressed and he's on antidepressants now. And then she goes to the A, she goes through a regular AA group. Oh, boom, my client's there. I'm guessing that this might happen to her sometimes. Uh, I think, especially in smaller communities, there aren't that many AA groups anyway. And I don't know. They didn't mention in the article how big the AA, because you know, some AA groups have three people in it and some of them have 300 people in it. Yeah. So if you're in a 300 one and you know, it's, that's a little different than if you're in a group of three, they didn't talk about that. But anyway, so what do you think about that? Why in the road, what should she have done? Should she have done anything differently at that point? I would say no. Um, though, or I, let, let me restate. Um, that sort of thing is probably unavoidable depending, like you said, on the size of the community. So, um, if it were me, I, I, let's see, what would I do? I could see where I might want to stay in the meeting because I'm attached to, you know, my community there. These are my good friends. Um, but I could also see where I might want to either stop going or um, uh, ask the client to find another meeting. Right. Uh, which is not an unreasonable thing to do, though I think a lot of therapist types find that kind of idea unkind. Right. So there's a context here. How many other groups are there? Right. You know, if this is a Friday night group and there are, 50, in Seattle, Friday night, there's, I'm guessing, hundreds of groups that are going on in, in the Seattle area. And so to ask a client, look, this is my group. It's, uh, it's very important to me. And, and if you come to the group, it's going to create what we call in the business a dual relationship, which is, which is you know, un, potentially an ethical violation or at least an ethical concern. And so it'd be much right. easier if you just went to one of the other groups. Is that okay with you? If it's not okay with you... I'll be happy to go to another group, you know, but as a courtesy to me, or what I was thinking was, 
right from the start, she should tell everyone, look, no one go to my AA group, <laughs> you know, in her group. She's like, all you, because it's, I would say 99% of the time, if you're in a chemical dependency group, you are going to go to an AA meeting. They're going to require, they usually require at least two per uh, week. Mm -hmm. And so she could have said, and I don't know if this is common practice for CDPs to say, this is the group I'm going to, please don't go to that group if, if you could. Uh, it's a free country, you can, but I'm just asking as a courtesy, just for me, if you just don't go to that group, because I want to keep my work separate from my recovery life, you know? Yeah. So, okay, so to me, that's that's already a concern. If I was a CDP, I if this if this were me, I absolutely would have some kind of system regarding this because I don't want to run into my clients in a situation like that because that's not like going to the movies where you're just sitting down and watching it. I mean, you're you're standing up in front. She, you know, in AA groups, the way that it's effective is you talk. You, you know, the baton comes around to you and you say, this week was tough. I, I had a, you know, I just lost my mother or I, I went on a binge last night or I am depressed again or I'm starting to become a sex addict now or I use cocaine or, you know, that's the anonymous part of it is it allows people to say the truth and, and really just say whatever they want because it's been shown that when people do that, recovery is made easier and the support you get. And so I would absolutely be telling my, I would either leave or I would tell my clients, don't come, please don't come to this group if you could. Or I would go to a group far out of town or I don't know, I just have, I would have some solution to that. I don't mind bumping into my clients at the Safeway, at the grocery store, or at the park or something. But in a situation like that, I would be personally sort of preoccupied the entire time. I'd just be sitting there going, okay, am I in getting, in, am I doing something wrong? Am, am you know, am, am, am I uh, able to be myself here? Is my client kind of weirded out by this? It, it would really just bother me. And so I, I would, I just don't want to be preoccupied with that sort of stuff. And so I, I would address that right from the start. So early in this, in this situation, I think she uh, was different than me. The second why in the road is they go to dinner afterwards. What do you think about that? What, what would you have done there? It's such an easy thing to avoid. Right. It's, it's, uh, I'm nonplussed. Yeah. Great. So, Hey, every, well, one, my guess is that she was already going to dinner with these people in AA prior to the client arriving in the AA group. And then someone invited him or mm -hmm. something. It's just, just a guess. And then, so at that point, again, that, and, th and this is why, even if this was a, a 300 person AA group, this is why you ask your clients not to come to that group or you don't go to that group because it, it's this slippery slope where, right. well, now everyone's going to dinner and, this is my group and he's already come to 30 AA meetings and I can't very well ask him to, to, to leave the meeting. This is my favorite meeting too. And all my friends are coming here right. and they just invite him into dinner. And what am I supposed to say? No, you can't be friends with him. I, I'm going to start dictating right. who can be fr like, I can't do, this is why in that first, why in the road, the people say like, well, what's the harm? Well, the harm is, is that it, it, one thing leads to another yeah. And da, da 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 Okay. So now they go to dinner and you know, so that might have seemed innocent to her, no big deal, but I would definitely feel preoccupied at right. that point. And, uh, yeah, then, you know, they go to dinner another time and everyone's, ah, I'm not going to go. And, and he's like, I'll go. And she's like, I'll go. And so it's just the two of them. Maybe she wouldn't want to go, but she feels compelled by social, you know, norm. Right. To say, okay. Yeah. Let's right. pretend this is just like any other. Right. I don't want to, I know he feels bad when people reject him. And so it'll, it'll be a bad thing if I reject him. So I better go. Right. So then they go to dinner and they apparently start to fall in love or at least yeah. be attracted to each other. Right. And then they actually start having sex. Yeah. And at this point, obvious why in the road that we should say you should not do again, 
there's Tinder people. Plus, to this woman, you have a husband at home. <laughs> so uh, that's always something to think about. It's a problem on many levels. Yeah. Maybe they had an open relationship. Who knows? They didn't talk about that. But the point is, is that this is a very common story of ethical violation, legal violation, because it's actually illegal in some states to have to have sex with your clients. I As, don't know if Washington's one of them, but uh, yes, it is. Okay, it is, I believe. Yeah. So it, it's 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 an obvious ethical violation. They will often say an ethical shorthand as a joke. They'll say a lot of things that you do as a therapist can be justified clinically, except for having sex with your client. That's like the one thing <laughs> that you can. Uh, that there's just no way of getting out of. Not that it hasn't been tried. Right. This justifying, but... Doesn't work. It's so easy to avoid. It's so easy to avoid. That's right. So, uh, what do you think should happen to the counselor? Because, so so what happened was the... Mm-hmm. the so the suicide occurs. Yeah. The client kills himself. Now, there's an investigation. Uh, you know, there the, at least the family starts asking questions. Yeah. The business partner starts asking, you know, the... Uh, maybe even the police or even her employer start asking questions. So what should happen to her, do you think? Well, what should happen to her or what will happen to her? Both, I guess. Okay, well, she should get a lawyer. Um, and it seems to me that the case is going to be about... Did, she should call her malpractice insurance and, and get a and lawyer. And get a lawyer, yeah. And the case is going to be about, did her actions contribute to his death? Yeah. It would be virtually impossible to prove one way or the other. Yeah. But... I think um, it would be hard for outsiders or even her to think that that couldn't be the case or that that there would be no impact whatsoever. Right. She's probably going to get fired. She's probably going to lose her license. Um, And I don't think those are bad or wrong. It seems like a terrible waste in a way if she's good at what she does. Yeah. Um, But it's just the way things are is there are certain limits. Yeah. Um, I think that her losing her license and losing her job are probably... Mm, I don't like that word appropriate because it sounds so... Um, Judgy? Yeah. Um, they, they they make a kind of sense. Yeah. Um, it would be hard to justify keeping somebody on staff who had done these violations or, or, or letting them still have their license to practice. Right. You, the, the overseeing bodies there, the employer is thinking if we keep her yeah. and she does something else, we're now liable. Fool me once, yeah. shame on George Bush. Fool me twice, something, something. something right. uh, and same for the licensing board. It's it's because th- that's a government agency, and if they license someone to practice, they make a mistake, and then you continue to allow them to practice. Now you're also on the hook if something happens again in the future, right? Okay, well, let me ask you this, Bob. Who should make the complaint if a complaint is to be made? Who's the person that makes the most sense to make the complaint? Well, probably the most obvious would be the family, presuming that they knew right. uh, this man, whoever this man's people are. Right, and that's who did it. A board complaint was made by the client's father regarding the sexual relationship and the eventual suicide. What do you think about, uh, what do you think the licensing board said about the counselor's behavior once the report was made and an investigation was, was, was uh, made? It seems to me that they'd be, they'd say that she violated uh, some ethical guidelines. Well, what do you, and what do you think they, they did? I think they probably took her license. Right. Upon investigation, the state board found the counselor's conduct was unprofessional and include boundary violations. The, li- the licensing board asked her to relinquish her license to practice mental health counseling. And what do you think she did after that? At, at that point? What do you think she did? Do you think she relinquished her license? Uh, that's a very good question. It's because like, she can fight it. She can say like, yeah. she can say, they're, they're basically asking her to voluntarily right. relinquish her license. It, she can say, no, we're, you're going to have to, we're going to have to go to court essentially or mediation yeah. or whatever. Make me. And, 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 and I will get a lawyer and I'll try to, right. I'll try to defend myself. What do you think she did? I, I, I could only imagine, I could imagine that she didn't do what I, what I think I would do, which is she fought it. I would just say, yep, here it is. Yeah, that's what she did. The counselor voluntarily relinquished her license to avoid further administrative actions right. and attorney's fees. Right. What else could the father do to get justice? What else could she could he do in addition to contacting the licensing board? It seems like he has a civil case at this point. Right, it's a, a, a malpractice claim. 
and uh, yeah, and what grounds uh, would the claim have? What are the grounds of that civil suit? Her boundary violation led to her. It led to his son's death. Right. In the claim, the plaintiff's experts alleged that the counselor was negligent by having sex with the client, which contributed to the client's suicide, and the counselor did not do enough to protect him from killing himself. So not only Mm -hmm. having sex with the client, but also upon learning that he was off his meds, that he was drinking again, and she was leaving town, she, she didn't do enough to to protect him from killing himself. Right. Because there were a lot of signs. She should have contacted a therapist or called the called the MHPs or right. somebody, you know, before leaving town or right. something. You can see how she wouldn't, that the secrecy, which is, I think, one of the big problems with this kind of relationship is that it has to take place in secret. And then the walls get kind of tall. Right. And the... Uh, the tendency that many people would have would be to keep their mouth shut and right. then not do as thorough a job as they otherwise would. Right. I'm actually surprised that while she was on the trip with her family, she called the business part- partner and said, I'm concerned about this yeah. guy. Because at this point, she's letting the cat out of the bag to yeah. some extent. And so, I, you know, yeah. in that way, she pushed past what I think a secrecy that a lot of other people wouldn't, wouldn't have pushed not, past yeah. at that point. They would just been like, well, I hope he didn't do anything. Yeah. I'm going to hope for the best and I'll go on with my vacation here. Yeah. All right. What percentage chance did the counselor have to win this lawsuit according to my malpractice insurance? They, they will evaluate it and say, here's the percentage chance. Yeah, so the so to the in malpractice insurance, their client is the is the counselor, is yeah. this woman, and they're and so they're going to say based on what we know, here's the chance that you're going to win, and this will guide us as to how we want to settle the case. So what was the the uh, estimate percentage as to the client winning the case? About zero. Almost fifteen percent. Wow. There's, there's a fifteen percent chance. That, which is, you know, pretty pretty low. How, how much was paid to the father in the end? Just just a guess. And this requires some actual numbers, knowledge of typical cases, which which might surprise you. But what? How much was uh, was awarded to the father? And so there was a settlement, yeah. or you know, whatever the case was. And so the malpractice insurance now has to pay the father some amount of money. How much do you think that was? I don't know what the formula is. Is it based, do they base these kinds of things on potential earnings of the person that's died? I don't think so. Okay, then it might be based on the limits of her. No, 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 no. I think it's just like, like I don't even know how they, yeah. how they, how they calculate it. Pain and suffering for the dad or, yeah. yeah I don't know. It's, it's going to be some kind of weird formula that, you know, outside of it, I, I don't know. So my, Liability insurance has uh, two million, four million, so two million per incident, four million aggregate right. over, I guess, a course of a year. If you have that many, oh right? My God. Yeah, it's always funny. Like my, mine's three and one. Yeah, and I was like, so per case, a million dollars, and then, but aggregate per year, per year, three million, three million. I'm like, how many people actually? Yeah. Where does that kick in for? Right. And actually, some some organizations, when they require you to get your malpractice, they'll say you must have at least yeah. three and one. And I'm always just like, really? Like, I understand the one million, but the aggregate three. Like, do you really think? But maybe it's like per per count. You know, maybe one case can incur f- three different. I don't know. Anyway, so how much do you think was awarded to the father? Two million dollars. Right. So that would have been my assumption. Like I, I'm thinking hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Especially since the malpractice insurance is the one paying for it, and the max is, you know, one or two million. So usually it's it's very high. It's only forty five thousand dollars. Forty five grand. That's yeah, it. That's it. And that's common from from the cases that I've read. They often that I, that must be the standard ish range that these sorts of things uh, happen. So you don't even necessarily need malpractice insurance for that, you know. Like yeah. you could potentially sell your car, get a second mortgage, and and pay that off yourself, which is which is kind of interesting, right? Yeah. And I think that's why our malpractice insurance is so cheap. cheap. You know, when right. you compare our malpractice insurance to surgeons, for instance. 
our malpractice insurance is pretty cheap. It's, it's something like in the one or two hundred dollar range per, per year, year, which is less than car insurance. You know what I mean? Way less than car insurance. <laughs> so, so maybe that's why. You yeah. know, I think it, it must just be a cultural thing within the legal system that they just don't award huge settlements for malpractice. You know, my brother is a civil lawyer. I'm going to ask him. Yeah. How do these things get calculated? He'll probably have some information that'd be right. interesting. I, I also wonder if it's because the, the counselor wasn't directly the cause of the death, right? Right. If if you're a police officer and in while you're chasing down a perp in a car and you run over and you know someone and kill them, you you ran over that person. You neglected to be safe and you killed someone while you were at work and. And so, but in this situation, she didn't cause his depression. She didn't, she didn't cause him to kill himself. Right. She was a factor, shall we say, yeah. in, in the, in the, in a, in someone's years and years of life of being depressed and right. binge drinking. And, and so maybe that's why, you know, that, and to me, that would make sense, that would make sense. If, if that would be the justification. Okay, um, you know, and it's important to to recognize she's not evil, she's not right. bad person. She's probably very dedicated. She's probably decent at what she does, and that this sort of thing happened to her. And I, the reason this is important is because what's the statistic of therapists who end up having sexual contact with their clients? It's, For men, it's something like three to three percent have at some point had intercourse or, you know, some third kind of, base kind of action. Yeah. For women, it's it's something like 0.3% yeah. or so. It's very, yeah. very few women therapists will will do this. Yeah. Did but, you say it's 3% for men? Some, well, they, they, you know, it depends on how you define sex right. a lot of times, but it's it's in that range, like yeah. t- 2 to 3%, which is a lot less than it was in the 70s. It was something like 10 or 15% yeah. back then because the culture was different. Right. But uh, but yeah, so it happens, and frankly, some of these therapists, in my estimation, are monsters. They are yeah, they predators. are evil. Yeah, we don't have any evidence with this with her. Yeah. At the very least, there's something seriously, I don't know, that she's got an issue of some kind. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. She she you know, uh, she either is not well trained or not well supervised yeah. or very much because to me you have to be very prone to denial in in my estimation to go down this road because at at the beginning of the road if we said look i have a crystal ball i can predict the future if you go to dinner with this group of people it will eventually lead to this future story what do you want to do she would say holy crap no I'm not going to go to dinner. That's that's terrible. Yeah. Uh, I don't want that for him. I don't want that for me. Right. I, I, geez, you know, I'm I'm glad you told me yeah. that. That is my guess. Um, so, but each step of the way, yeah. she, you know, to to you and me, I I wouldn't be able to sit straight in that dinner. I'd just be like, oh my god, get me out of here. Oh my god, get me out of here. And and I've actually been in situations like that. Actually, I'll tell you. As a professor, there's a lot more socializing between students and professors right. because the students are my age or older or you know around my age, and right. and so there will be social events, and some of it involves alcohol or dinner or whatever. And so there, when I'm in a situation like that, I am massively preoccupied. And these are just students of mine; they're not right. clients. Right. I am thinking, okay, uh, what am, what, am, what, how do I act here? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? You know, what's happening? How are they perceiving me right now? Am, am I, am I presenting too much of myself right now? You know what's happening, and so I can't imagine what it would be like to be a with a client. I've never been in a situation like that. Have you ever been in a situation no. like that? So. You can imagine just so for her to just go blank about that, or we don't know her process. Maybe she was very preoccupied, but not enough anyway. For her to be able to just turn that off, to me, says something about her. It's just a guess that there's some some kind of psychological issue got in the way of her seeing and noticing something that most counselors and therapists would have noticed. It may be that she did. Um, You know that? Do you ever see that kid's book? If you give a mouse a cookie. 
No. This mouse shows up at this kid's door and asks for a cookie. And the kid says yes. And so if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. And um, after he has his cookie and his glass of milk, he's going to be tired and he's going to want to take a nap. So you're going to make a place on the couch and you're going to tuck him in. And that story is about the difficulty in saying no to a small thing. If I say yes to a small thing, it's very easy for me to say yes to a bigger thing and a bigger thing and a bigger thing, um, despite my own feelings about the thing. And this is how car salespeople sell cars. Is right. they get you, there's a dissonance that takes place. If you say yes to a small thing, you're more likely to say yes to a larger thing and ignore, which I think is why it's important to say, this lady is probably not evil. Right. I mean, I, I have strong feelings about evil. I don't think anybody's evil. Um, uh, but she is not some kind of predator more than likely. And I would guess that why I agree with you that some folks out there with licenses are predators. Most people who get into this field have some, you know, genuine desire to be useful or helpful. So um, um, it would be very easy to ignore this little voice inside that says, uh, it's okay for this mouse to have a cookie or for this guy to go to my AA meeting when it's not. Yeah. And... If the boy had been through years of school ah, and continuing point. education, yes, excellent point. Saying, "Do not have sex with your clients," right. or what? "Do not give a cookie to a to a mouse," right. <laughs> and when a mouse comes to your door, consult with your parents. <laughs> um, Brilliant. There's, you know, that's a little. That's just to me. I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to be righteous or something but it always just amazes me yeah. that people can do this sort of thing it just seems so uh at least self-destructive at the very least Nicely and put. and i've heard so many other stories about people have been writing into the podcast talking about how they have entered in as clients into sexual or s mm. almost sexual relationships with their, with therapist. their therapist and it just it just always go goes horribly wrong yeah. for everyone yeah and i just think like what is wrong you yeah. know and then I, I always just imagine that they are the the therapists they are lonely probably they're hurt by their current relationship or they're having a hard time meeting people or something, which isn't uncommon. And that creates this biological, psychological oh. need that just completely overshadows their better judgment. Yeah. And they're at work all the time and they're tired and then they meet someone and they kind of forget that they're at work and they're like, oh, I could like this person. And then you know, once you fall in love or whatever you want to call it, it's hard to steer that ship away from that. Yeah. And so anyway, what could the counselor have done to reduce her risk of malpractice? What do you think she could have done? Um, the very thing that you said at the beginning, which is just announce to her clients, this is my meeting. Please don't go. Right. Good. Very easy thing. Yeah. Other things she could do is understand the law she can review her code of ethics more uh, more periodically. I don't know if she did. She could practice in accordance with the standard of care, <laughs> which is to not do these sorts of things. She could seek peer review or clinical supervision. She could actively participate in continuing education programs related to these sorts of issues. She could manage her counter-transference. We haven't really talked about that very much. There's a whole system or several models of how to manage one's countertransference, how to notice it, how to evaluate it, how to think about it, what to do about it. And I have found that most people, this is a terrible thing to say, but it's, it's my opinion that when I ask even experienced counselors about countertransference, they have a minimal understanding of what that means to them or they have for instance i find that if if i some people so let me just tell you the range of things that i that i get from people because yeah. i supervise a lot of people even right. people that have been in the field for you know 10 20 years and i ask them what's your counter transference they're on on ones the bad end of the spectrum they'll say like i'm not ha i don't have any oh. or 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 they'll even look at me what do you mean and so there's that and then 
a shade up from that is a sort of defensiveness. Like, well, why? Like, why are you asking me? Like, mm. you know, is or or no? You know, of course not. I'm I'm a professional. I don't have countertransference. Mm. Or you know, just that kind of. Thing. And then a shade up from that is, or kind of a leap forward, but still in the bad side of the spectrum is, is oh yeah, countertransference, huh? Um, what am I? What am I feeling? Like it's the first time they've reflected on that. And, and they'll say something like, um, well, I, I'm feeling, yeah, well, I, you know, I, I like the clients and, uh, yeah, sometimes the client will be kind of annoying sometimes because, and then they'll go on a long explanation as to why the client is annoying rather than self-reflecting on why they happen to be annoyed with it, which is a very different question. It is. And so, um, so then there's that kind of range. And then up from that is uh, more ability to take responsibility. The rare case, and I do have people that are like this, when I do ask them, you know, about the countertrans, so for instance, they were like, yeah, well, I, I think about this a lot. And I have a lot of feelings, you know, because this person reminds me of my mother in this way and triggers some of my, you know, childhood kind of parental issues as a child and um, sometimes I'll, I'll feel quite upset at the client and that's on me um, and I try to manage that by reminding myself that this is not my dad and right. everything's okay and I try to te- take deep breaths and I try to reconnect with my compassion for the client and remember that compassion is the way <laughs> and and uh, and I talk with my therapist about it and I talk with my counselor and I'm talking with you about it and uh, and there's and I'm guessing there's a whole section of countertransference that I'm really not even quite aware of yet. You know, maybe you can help me out with that. Do you do you see anything? When I hear that, yeah. <laughs> then I know not only are you like on the quote unquote good end of the spectrum, but you're in the you're in the correct zone. This isn't like an ideal world. This is like where you should be. This right. is my expectation. Like you should. This is where you should be. Yes. And the problem is, is that a lot of training programs don't talk about it enough or super. And, and Mm -hmm. in my estimation, really the place where it gets neglected is at your internship when you're a, when you're an intern, because it's the supervision is, is mainly a practice of making sure you turn your paperwork in on time and Mm -hmm. trying to, you know, talk about like how many clients you have and just all the administrative stuff. A lot of interns will tell me, my supervisor doesn't even talk about countertransference. And when they do, they don't seem very comfortable talking about it, honestly. And so, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Am I, am I being too harsh on our, on our field to say that, that most people are not in the, in the expected zone? Well, you would know a lot better than me. I, I don't supervise. Um, uh, I'm not surprised. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know a lot of therapists. I so. do. Do, do they seem... Non-self-reflective? Yeah, quite frankly. And ones that I think are actually pretty good um, have a vulnerability. To because I know you to be very self-reflective. My bread and butter. <laughs> and from the beginning, I've always admired your ability to be honest about your own issues in relation to your clients. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Thanks. Uh, I should say that it, when we were in graduate school together... Bob, you're like four or five years older than me, mm-hmm. which when I was 24 was a big deal. One, two, you knew you wanted to be a therapist for a long time. You had more experience with therapy or something. Mm-hmm. And I was just a 24-year-old jock from the University of Washington and and didn't know even what empathy meant. That's that's always kind of, kind of my my thing that I really focus on is I remember in ProSem, we talk, it was like a week where we talked about empathy and I remember thinking like, oh, I've never heard this word before. I've heard sympathy before, but what's empathy? <laughs> and everyone else in the class knew fully well what the word meant and what the implications were for being a therapist. And, and, I, and I was looking around the room and I was like, everyone else knows this stuff and I don't even know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. And you were one of the people that, that definitely knew what it meant and definitely knew and so uh, around that time and right after graduation, there were a lot of things that I remember admiring about you. And that was mm-hmm. one of them, just the ability to, 
to be real and to be honest about like, oh yeah, that's my that's my bullshit right there, and this is this is that, and and you would never say like, but I've dealt with it and moved on. You'd be like, and I pro- I'm probably never going to be able to get over this one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is probably always going to get at me, right? So, I, I would like to think so. Yeah. Uh, though I would like to be over these things. That would be nice too. <laughs> right, right. But no one ever is. Mm-hmm. So, right, okay. So she could have managed her counter transference better. Oh. I don't know. There was no details on that, but I'm just going to take a guess and say that she wasn't as robust as she could have been. And frankly, it, this is another terrible thing to say, and maybe I'll get angry emails, but in my experience... CDPs aren't as well trained or well practiced in this area. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I, I've I've worked in a number of dual diagnosis situations, oh. and it's just not in their culture in chemical uh-huh. dependency treatment. It's just not in their culture, or their treatment, or their education focus to even talk about countertransference. Oh. I mean, they might. I'm, I'm guessing they talk about professionalism and this sort of thing, but uh, in my experience. There's there's almost no if no talk about their own personal issues coming into the relationship and, and being triggered. Do you think that's a trenches thing? Uh, what's that? Like um, I learned in the trenches alongside of the people that I'm trying to help. Yeah, and we are more peers than I am. Um, yeah, and just you know the history of chemical dependency yeah, treatment um, yeah. is not the history of psychotherapy, which right. is based in psychoanalysis, which Freud set up to be completely a, a centered to some extent on your countertransference. Yeah. And I mean, at least to be aware of it, you know, Freud would say, everyone will have countertransference, which is counter to the client's transference. And so when you have countertransference, which he used as a word to refer to what we might consider more severe countertransference today, he, he didn't have the totalistic view of, of countertransference the way most people do today. But anyway, oh, anyway, and when you had countertransference, you immediately had to go to psychoanalysis to work through that so that you didn't have that countertransference anymore. And frequently his pupils would come back to him and say, oh, I had countertransference. I need to re-enter analysis and talk about that. And analysis wasn't just like one hour of consult. It was, it was several hours a week. And so when you had countertransference, you would enter into this, you know, a lot of time dedicated to talking about why you were having something triggered in you from a patient's transference. And so uh, Psychotherapy has that rich history yeah. regarding countertransference, and I'm just guessing that chemical dependency does not. Just does not. Yeah, yeah. I, and you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you can you can let me know. It's just anecdotal for me. Also, um, she could have referred the client uh, when when uh, at a certain point. Um, I don't know exactly how that would have worked, but uh, it's still. You but know, yeah, once a therapist, always a therapist. Right. So. Right. I mean, I guess in this situation, this is just a general thing that anyone can do, but I guess this is uh, specifically she could have said, you need to go do a different AA yeah, meeting. Right. After uh, termination, uh, in general, we should not contact our clients. We should not have any kind of uh, contact with clients uh, because it can lead to you know boundary issues. Uh, obviously, not having friendships with clients, that's something we, we want to avoid. We also want to avoid all dual relationships. And obviously, not having sex with clients is something she could have done <laughs> to reduce <laughs> her risk of malpractice. And, you know, and I just want to point out that, it, you know, th- that we haven't really, or I haven't emphasized this point, is that we have a client who is dead. That's a very real thing. Yeah. You know, a client killed himself. Right. And there is a very real possibility that this therapist's actions contributed to that, yeah. which I'm sure she feels awful about. And I'm sure this must be very complicated for her. Oh, yeah. But this is why, in an extreme way, we concern ourselves with the avoidance of dual relationships. Yeah. It's not just an academic thing that we're supposed to follow the rules and it's appropriate or inappropriate. It's a matter of, to some extent, life or death yeah. for some people. So it's not always, it's also not about self-protection. I mean, that's right. of course an element in it, but 
you do take on, a, I, th I think, a sacred duty when you enter into a helping relationship with somebody. You owe them your best. Yeah. That's just the deal. What do you mean, sacred duty? Can you tell, tell, say more about that? Um, somebody in pain has come to you. They're in a vulnerable spot. Um, I think you have a, an obligation. Um, I think I, you, all of us have an obligation to uh, take that very seriously and do everything that we know to do to uh, make their lives better, not worse. Yeah. And um, entering into that kind of relationship, um, I think it's pretty clear that it may not have been uh, the sole or direct cause of that man's death. It was clearly one of the pieces of the pie, though, and a very easy one to avoid. And um, while I said to you, I don't think she's evil, she did indeed fail. Right. And she failed somebody. Yeah. Well, that does it for this episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself and stay out of ethical snafus because you deserve it.